Hello and welcome to Student Affairs Now. I'm your host, Susana Munoz. Today is a special treat as I get to interview one of my faculty mentors, my sheroes, Dr. Laura Rendon. Uh, we'll learn about her career, her wisdom, and her insights into the field of higher education and social justice. I'm so excited you agreed to do this, Dr. Student Affairs Now is the premier podcast and learning community for thousands of us who work in, alongside, or adjacent to the field of higher education and student affairs. We hope that you'll find these conversations make a contribution to the field and are restorative to the, prof to the profession. We release new episodes every week on Wednesdays. You can find us at studentaffairsnow.com or on Twitter. Silas, we have two sponsors today, Silas and Leadership. Silas is a proud sponsor of Student Affairs Now podcast. Browse our student affairs, diversity, and professional development titles at silaspub.com. Use promo code SA now for a 30% off of all books plus free shipping. You can find Stylus on Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, LinkedIn, and Twitter at, um, at Silas Pub. Also, Leadership is one of our sponsors today. Leadership is a not-for-profit organization that has been partnering with colleges, universities, and organizations in creating transformational leadership experiences since 1986. With a focus on creating a more just, caring, and thriving world, Leadership provides both virtual and in-person leadership development opportunities for students and professionals. When you partner with Leadership, you will receive quality development experiences that engage learners in topics of courageous dialogues, integrity, equity, resilience, and community building. To find more about our virtual programs, please visit um, leadership at www.leadership.org slash virtual programs. You can also learn more about the organization on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and LinkedIn. As I mentioned, I'm your host, Susana Munoz. My pronouns are she, her, hers, and ella. I'm an associate professor of higher education leadership at Colorado State University. I'm hosting this conversation today from Fort Collins, Colorado, which is the ancestral homelands of the Ute, Arapaho, and Cheyenne peoples. Now let's get to our conversation. Welcome, Laura. Glad to hola, you. hola, hola, Susana. Un placer est uh, estar contigo. Gracias. So I want to just kind of have you do a quick introduction of yourself and also just so we, we, we've known each other, you know, throughout the years, just a little quick explanation how we know each other. Bienvenida. Well, well gracias, <laughs> gracias. <laughs> uh, well, Susana, uh, first of all, I'm so proud of all that you become uh, and are becoming. Uh, it's, it's just uh, uh, wonderful to have seen your growth uh, from seeing you as a, you know, emerging scholar. And I, I met you at, at, I believe, at Iowa State and yes. you were had just finished your doctorate and here you are, uh, you know, one of the emerging stars in higher ed. And so I'm, <laughs> I'm always thrilled to see that in students. So congratulations. Gracias. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and you're retired. Kind of. But, sort of. <laughs> <laughs> what, what, what are you doing with your time right now? I, I left the university so you can, say I'm retired from the university, but I'm not retired from the work that I am so passionate mm -hmm. about, um, the work of student success and really fostering success for low-income first-generation students. And so a lot of my time is focused on really working with colleges and universities throughout the nation, uh, doing some uh, presentations based on what I've learned, my scholarship, uh, so that they can in turn use that work to help them to, to uh, foster success and, and equity for uh, students that um, really um, need the, the most help uh, in our society. So that has never left me and I'm, I'm pleased to do that. Nice, nice. I have to say, I wanna tell, tell the audience a story. I remember taking one of the classes that you did around um, student Student retention in higher education. I think mm -hmm. you did it with Amaury Nora, and mm -hmm. um, and so I I think that was very profound for me because you centered it on Latinx students, mm -hmm. and uh, for me because it was profound because I was like, wow, you could do this. You could just center, you know, yourself. You know, so 
it really gave me permission to really um, within my own teaching is to make sure that we're privileged, privileging, you know, populations and ourselves in ways that we have never historically been privileged in the curriculum. So thank you for that. Oh, uh, it's 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 great to hear that because I I think that you know we one of the things that the 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 more advanced scholars need to do is to open the doors for the emerging scholars. And one of the ways is to model what we believe in. Mm -hmm. And so uh, opening that door, uh, you know, could include you know, saying, I'm going to talk about Latinx students. I'm going to talk about African-American students. I'm going to bring in this literature. I'm going to bring in these speakers. And that that's a sort of affirmation that's academic mm -hmm. validation, as I would put it, because exactly. then you say, well, I see myself in that. So that's a very powerful um, kind of activity to undertake. Mm -hmm. So thank you for yeah. mentioning that. Yeah, yeah. So, so one of my first questions I have for you, Doctora, is that you're, you know, you're a pillar in the field of higher education. You've had a career spanning uh, 45 years. Is that correct? Maybe. Who's counting? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> At least 45. I would At say. least. Well, right? That's a long okay. time. That's a long time. <laughs> it is. Um, so have you seen how, how have you seen higher education shift over time, you know, in what ways, you know, have you, have you shifted in those 45 years? Well, there's been a lot that, that, that has happened. And of course, one of the things that I'm really happy to see is more students of color, more faculty and staff of color than when I was starting out 45 years ago or 50, whatever it is. Um, I, you know, we were at the time, um, you know, one of the few and, and, and those of us that were professors, we, we, we all kind of knew each other, yeah. we, knew what we were, we followed each other's work. Sometimes we collaborated with each other. So I'm, I'm, I'm happy to see now, if you go to ASH, if you go to NASPA, ACPA, a strong contingent of, of um, of faculty and staff of color. I, I you know, see the student body getting more complex uh, in, in terms of race, gender, sexuality, um, you know, just uh, uh, all of these intersectional identities that, that students hold within themselves and how they say, hey, you know, I, I'm not gonna be this or that. I'm going to embrace everything of, uh, of who I am. I also see the influence of technology, uh, particularly during the pandemic, everyone having to shift to online learning. And I think that, that we're, going to, um, we're going to see that more and more. I personally love technology. I'm not an expert on it, but I think that we need to, um, we need to really learn more about it because if we don't, we're gonna be left behind. Um, and I've also seen the social issues that impact our society seeping into higher education in a way that they've become part and parcel of the curriculum of what higher education becomes concerned about. For example, Black Lives Matter, immigration, gun violence, um, you know, the violence against the uh, uh, LGBTQ plus community. All of these issues are now part of what higher education entertains um, and uh, and so I, I, you know, there's there's really not as much separation now between the academy and what happens in the larger society. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you know, one of the things that I think you've brought up to 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 me before is your experience as um, being a Chicana at University of Michigan during the second wave of the um, affirmative action litigations, and wondering, you know. We're still having litigations on affirmative action, actually, <laughs> <No>. right? <laughs> so, you know, what what is it? You know, what what specifically can you pinpoint about the changes in our environment compared to you know what it was like for you at you know being a Chicana in Michigan during the uh, late seventies and eighties? Well, I, I think there's more support now for faculty mm -hmm. and students just because there's a, a, a critical mass now. Uh, that that students and faculty can turn to for support. We did not have as much of a critical mass when I was at Michigan. We did have a group of us that, you know, we were there and we knew who we were, we supported each other, we had get togethers. 
uh, on weekends, we went out and got a beer, or a cup of coffee, and we talked about our lives and what we planned to do. It was really touching, you know, when you think mm -hmm. back on, on those years. And, and, and people went on to do great things. You know, uh, we got together with a lot of social workers because Michigan at the time, they had um, the, a really good uh, school of social work. And a lot of the, the, the Latinx students were in the social work program. So we connected a lot with them and they all went on and did great things. There are a few of us in education and in, in, in social psychology uh, that um, I, I, I am good friends with them. I have people like Aid Hurtado, who's a superstar in, mm -hmm. in the world of, of, of I, 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 you know, student identities and you know, uh, social psychology. People like Hector Garza, who went on and created the National Council for Community and Education, President of Haku, and on and on. I mean, it's just, you, we were there, and, and the people that were there, many of them went on and did really, really great things. And I'm proud to be a part of that cohort. Yeah. I, I remember at a conference I was sitting at a table with you, I think it was Sylvia Hurtado, Aida Hurtado, mm -hmm. and you were all talking about your aventuras that you had in grad school. <laughs> and it was so fun to just listen to you all sort of like re reminisce about like your experiences, you know, and all those, all those yeah. events that you all took, you know, as grad students. Yeah, well, we were so, so young. I mean, late twenties, early thirties. Uh, we had hopes, we had dreams, we, we wanted to just go out and and really do the best that we could for our communities and uh, and I you know I, I I I'm gratified that I feel that I have I have mm -hmm. done some of that so um, so yeah it was a wonderful experience I have very fond memories of my time mm -hmm. as a doctoral student at Michigan yeah yeah thank you for sharing that um, so you you grew up in in Laredo Texas which is a border town and yeah. um, and it, in reading your your recent memoir, I appreciate your your discussion about your relationship, you know, with the border, and and so how you talked about how the navigation of the borderlands is not a metaphor. Could you share some lessons about how um, you know how you've gained by what you've gained by living through these borderlands? Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, growing up in Laredo, Texas, uh, early on when Laredo in the you know, 50s and late 40s, 50s, uh, tremendous poverty uh, there it still has a lot of poverty, but much more so during that time. It was one of the poorest cities in the nation. And growing up in poverty, I mean, you see everybody around you in the same state. You don't, you think everybody's like that. <laughs> you, mm -hmm. I had no idea that I, I was living in poverty. I just thought everybody was like that. And um, uh, growing up right on the border, I mean, it's, you've got Laredo, Texas, the Rio Grande and Nuevo Laredo. Um, we grew up as one big happy city because there was a lot of crossing over. You, we would say, vamos al otro lado. And we would mm. go to the mercado, we would go to restaurants, um, we would go to nightclubs when we were in our 20s. And, and we, would, we all had a great time you know, doing that. It was just one big happy family. Um, but you know, it's interesting because you grow up in this um, liminal space, what Gorena Saldua calls Nepantla, uh, where you, you're, you're Mexican, but, but you're American, you speak English, you speak Spanish, you have the American experience, you have the Mexican experience. My mother was born in Mexico, um, and, um, uh, and I'm about 35% uh, indigenous as well, according to ancestry.com. Mm -hmm. So I embrace my uh, indigenous, uh, uh, identity as well. Um, but, you know, one of the things that it did for me is, is to uh, be comfortable living in ambiguity uh, mm -hmm. and not always having to know what's going to happen. And so there are people that are very, very structured. And I think we need that. You know, I'm not that type of person and yet I get a lot of things done. And I don't need to have all the answers right away. I mean, I think that we need to remain open and so I became very comfortable with ambiguity. 
um, and um, and and I believe that living in that in between space of this liminal space in the butler allows you to know that you're feeling some distress and some tension because you're neither here nor there, ni aquí ni allá. But at the same time, uh, I've learned to appreciate that that is a space of possibility. That is a space of growth. That is the space where I believe our best ideas evolve. Uh, so I, I embrace uh, that, that middle space. I embrace Nepantla. Yes, that, that ambiguity, yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, I think that's, you know, you know, because we we navigate contexts where we are always the first, uh, we're always the only. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of times there's definitely these questions of, do I belong, right? Is this, is this a space that, and so I think what, um, especially you talk about Gloria and Sandua's work, I think um, what, what that Gloria and Sandua's taught me is that, um, that we we can't we do belong and yet we probably we need to sort of reclaim and reshift and make these spaces more conducive to our own humanity and our own liberation right we belong and we've always belonged uh mm -hmm. it's just that we were meant to feel that you know yeah we didn't belong and, and the higher education was very very exclusive from the very very beginning uh, and, I mean, you can look into the history of it that I won't get into now, but but it has been an exclusive elitist uh, uh, academy. And um, uh, as as we started to you know, move in there and and slowly but surely grown in terms of numbers, I think things are changing now. But we've got a long, long ways to grow. Um, I've been recently very influenced myself with Gloriana Saldua's work. Uh, as you could see from my memoir, I, mm -hmm. I call it, you know, a first generation scholars, Camino de Conocimiento, it's my journey mm -hmm. toward enlightenment. And of course, Conocimiento is, is uh, <clears throat> a term that, um, that evolved from Guarana Saldua's work. Um, mm -hmm. I did visit her graveside in, in Hard Hill, mm -hmm. Texas. She grew up in poverty as well. And um, if you go to Hargill, I mean, it's you can barely see that little town, un ranchito, mm -hmm. uh, right in, in, in the Rio, uh, Rio Grande Valley area. Um, and you, you would think, here's this iconic figure known internationally, uh, how she could evolve from such a little place where people are raising pigs and chickens and there's so much poverty there. Uh, and so I make a point in my memoir how uh, no matter how poor you think the community is, there's lots of strengths there. There's lots of brilliance there. There's lots okay. of intelligence there. And we should not give up on these communities. These wonderful mm -hmm. people come out of these communities. Absolutely. And I know in your memoir, you talk about um, your friends from Laredo, like Norma Cantu yes. and Am Amaury Nora. Um, Maori yeah. Nora actually wrote me an email and um, wanted to say, as you know, Laura and I have known each other since eighth grade. <laughs> How, however, I believe our journey in higher education began when the two of us were instructors or counselors at Laredo Junior College. I first mm -hmm. saw the, the person and passion that Laura had for students and her desire to focus on us all of our efforts in helping our Chicano, Chicana students and Ch 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 Chicani ex students. We have remained connected to each other through all these years in spite of the fact that she took a qualitative route and I took a quantitative route. Esta <laughs> Mari. In our, in our desire to join forces and trying to help students succeed. One interesting thing is that while she began her research through a quantitative, as, through a quantitative dissertation, she has turned out to be quite the qualitative scholar. Um, I'm not sure there, uh, yes. Yeah, so, so I think he said it's been the beginning of a wonderful relationship that has lasted, lasted many, many, many years. So, and Maori wanted very, to share these words. He's a very, very dear friend. And that's kind yes. of unusual because yes, we did know each other uh in, in in the eighth grade although we didn't <laughs> we weren't really friends at that time but we were in that same class oh. i always look at him as being this nerdy privileged kid 
Let a car when nobody else did. Oh, yeah. <laughs> wow. <laughs> that's, that's nice. Yeah. yeah. I always, it's, and you talk about the brilliance that comes out of these, you know, these, Absolutely. these sounds. And, you know, you all are this, those examples. You know, Norma Cantu is another one that you both, uh, you and her were receiving doctorates around the same time, both from Laredo yes. as well. Yes. Yeah. yes. Yeah. We finished our doctorates at the same time. We held a party, you know, where we invited our families and we had carne asada and all that stuff. We had a band and uh, it was, it's, a, it's, a, it's a beautiful memory. Yeah. I mean, we knew that two women in 1984, would, no, 1982 would have earned a doctorate. Two women from Laredo earning mm. a doctorate at the same time. Wow. Yeah. And the, the contributions that you both of you have made to the academy I mean, we, oh, yeah. Yeah. That phenomenal phenomenal yes. she's a brilliant scholar herself yes thanks so um i know you're you're always tied to validation theory and yes. um so that's one of the most popular questions that i get from students and um for other professionals is about your validation theory and I wanted to see if, if you wanted to have this opportunity to say a little bit more about the origin story of validation theory. Sure, uh, I, I developed validation theory in the 90s when I was at Arizona State University and I was working with a team of researchers um, and uh, we had a grant from the U.S. Department of Education and the grant created the National Center for for teaching, learning, and assessment. It was headquartered at Penn State University. So I had the privilege of working with people like Jim Radcliffe, uh, Pat Deranzini, um, uh, Ernie Pescarella, Vincent Tinto, um, and Amaudi was a part of that team as well. And uh, so we all had our own distinct uh, research um, agendas. So Pat Terencini and I and my graduate student at the time, Romero Jalomo, who's now president at, at Hartgill, uh, mm. Hartnell College, I should say. Um, we were looking, we were working with Sandy Aston's involvement theory uh, to look at uh, how students succeeded that first semester of college. And so we interviewed students in two and four year institutions uh, and um, Romero and I interviewed community college students. Um, so while we had involvement theory in mind, as we looked at the transcripts and we would have, uh, I don't know, monthly meetings, I think it was to go over the transcripts and what we were learning. It occurred to me that what the students were saying when we asked them, what's making a difference for you? Why are you still in college while others have left? They didn't say it was because I got involved in college. They didn't say it was because I went to the library or because I went to uh, see a faculty member that, in other words, them taking the initiative. Rather, they were saying things that related to how someone took an interest in them. The validation mm -hmm. was coming from us as educators to them. When someone reached out and said, I believe in you, I'm here for you, I care about you, let me help you with your writing. Uh, let me meet with you um, in the cafeteria or uh, you know, in a coffee shop so we can go over uh, your writing or some of the questions that you have. And so you know, they talked with many examples of, of um, the time that they felt that I can do this. And it was related to the connection, the relationship that they had built with someone in or outside of college. As we need to remember that sometimes students don't have validating agents, not all of us do. And so when they don't, then it, it's upon us to step in and overturn a lot of the invalidation that students sometimes get. Sometimes being told you're not good enough or getting that mm -hmm. message that you know, makes them doubt that maybe college is not for me. So we've got to turn that around. And part of turning that around, I think, involves validating relationships. There's a book out now, it's called um, Relationship Rich Education mm -hmm. by Peter Felton and Leo Lambert. I just did a panel with Peter uh, last week for Achieving the Dream. 
And uh, basically they talk about how relationships are, are the foundation for success for students. Mm -hmm. And uh, that basically goes right in line with what I've been saying for many years now, since the nineties, the importance of validation, the importance of, of really um, having us take the initiative to reach out to students to help them believe that they can do this. After they feel that they're ready to go, uh, and you know they'll they're not going to need as much validation later on, but at the beginning, underserved students will need that sort of support. Mm -hmm. uh, so, part of that thinking came from reading a book that had been released uh, around the t in the '90s. It was called "Women's Ways of Knowing," mm -hmm. uh, Belenki to rule, and they talked about how women were. Uh, not treated as well as men in the classroom and their ways of knowing were often not um, really given credit or recognized or acknowledged. And I thought to myself, a lot of what they're saying applies to students of color. And so I begin to give all of that very deep thinking. And um, so anyways, uh, I, that's when I developed validation theory and it takes a while I've learned for a theory to take off, but I can tell you that probably validation theory and you helped me to mm -hmm. expand it uh, uh, some more. Yeah. Validation theory has never been more popular. Uh, yeah. And so over and over again, I mentioned validation uh, to, uh, to faculty and staff when I give my presentations. And um, uh, so it, it, it's, it's, it's still alive. And I think it, it'll continue to live for a long, long time. Yes, that's, yeah. I think this is why I continue to be asked about it is because I think yes. it's, it's still, you know, folks are trying to still um, grapple with, okay, how do we institutionalize it? How do we make it part of our curriculum? And now, you know, one of your other important scholarly contributions that is in, the, in our field is um, in a book titled um, Sente Pensante Pedagogy, you know, that you published with yeah. Silas. Um, you discussed sort of the importance of contemplated teaching and, and learning practices. Um, given the times that we are in today, what, what, would, what, what new things would you add? What new inspirations would you add to that? I, I have been in the process on and off because I'm so busy, even though I'm quote unquote retired, um, of updating Santi Santa Pedagogy. I think in, in my publisher, John Van Noring, um, who actually heard the seed of Santi Pensante when I hadn't even called it Santi Pensante way back in the early 90s. And uh, he said, I want to publish your book. And I'm like, wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not ready to, I, this is just an idea. He said, I don't care, I want to publish it. And he did. So I thank him uh, tremendously for, for believing in me. Um, so updates, um, I, I believe, again, the work of Gloria Nasaldua will, mm -hmm. will be a part of this new version of, of Senti Pensante Pedagogy, because I believe that the whole notion of conocimiento is inherent in, um, in, in deep learning, this, this sort of, of, of us moving toward a higher form of enlightenment. Uh, and so rather than calling the, the, the practices contemplative practices, contemplative tools, I want to call them, for example, estrategias de conocimiento, strategies of mm -hmm. enlightenment. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I also, I'm also thinking that it's important to know that students will respond well to a, to a pedagogy that is connected to justice and equity. So I, I want to give that more emphasis. Uh, they, they, they connect more to a pedagogy that allows them to give back and to have an impact on their communities um, because they want, they, they want to know things. They want to definitely earn that, that degree or credential, but it's not just to hang it on the wall. They want mm -hmm. to they want to use that knowledge to better their communities, uh, to better their families, to make this place a better place to live. And, um, and they also connect to a pedagogy that allows them to include their personal experiences, their personal stories. So storytelling uh, becomes very important here as well. So um, I, I, I believe that right now, especially 
We need pedagogies that speak to contemporary times. People are suffering. Um, I'm very um, interested now also in, in trauma and, um, mm. and healing. Um, and I've been doing a, some sessions on that uh, as well. Um, you know, May Simad is somebody that I really respect. Uh, she's a scientist. She teaches at um, Pima Community College and she works with something called trauma-informed pedagogy. Mm. Um, and of course we have anti-racist pedagogy and, uh, and we've had culturally responsive pedagogy. So all of these pedagogies I think are really, really, really important. Um, and, I, and I believe that these are the kinds of pedagogies that are important, uh, especially uh, during these times um, of, of, of the pandemic and of people hurting and suffering and, and wanting to heal and, and wanting to better their lives. Uh, so at any rate, that, those are some, that's some of the thinking that I have with regard to the future of Senti Pensante mm -hmm. Pedagogy. And again, this came out in 2009. It has never been more popular. I give right. talks today on two major things, validation and Senti Pensante. And now I'm adding trauma and healing. Uh, but those, those, those are the top two. Nice, nice. No, that's great to hear that, you know, your your work is so in demand. One of the things that you mentioned is sort of, you know, trauma-informed practices and um, the healing. And, you know, as a result of the pandemic, I think um, you're switching to sort of academic leaders. Um, you know, what advice would you give, uh, you have for us in the academic positions and academic leadership positions to ensure that we don't go back to quote unquote normal after the pandemic. I don't think I don't think any of us wanna go back to where we were. And so um, those of us that are in academic leadership positions or in leadership positions, how do we reconcile with that? I agree. I think many people don't want to go back to where we were, at least I hope not. Uh, we're between, we're in a liminal space right now. Uh, we're in Nepantla mm -hmm. where we had got one foot in the old world as we knew it in the academy and another foot on the new world that is emerging in the academy. So this is a time of transformation. This is a time to learn the lessons of 2020. Mm -hmm. What did we not get right? What do we need to do better? What do we need to change? If we don't take time to reflect on that, then we're going to revert to what we used to do. And really nothing has changed. We haven't really grown. And that would be, I think, a great shame. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we need to take the best of what we did in the past and then begin to really do something different in the future, learn the lessons, learn what needs to change and move forward. I think we need to be bold. I need to, I think we need to really see leaders bring faculty and staff together and say, what is going to be our post pandemic vision of education? Mm, What's like this gonna look like now uh, on our campus? What are we gonna keep? What are we gonna change? What are we gonna discard? How do we move forward? so that we have a better academy. Mm. Uh, so, you know, that's my thinking al along those lines. Yeah, no, I like that a lot. Um, and so over the years, what, what has sustained you while working in higher education? Um, if you can think back to the most challenging time in your career, um, what support or mechanisms were most useful for you? What was most useful for me had to do with my friends and my colleagues, uh, people that I could turn to when I was struggling. And we all struggle in the academy. We have all had our big challenges. And um, uh, it, it's always helpful when we have a, a group of people that we can just sit down and say, you know, I just want to sort this through. And um, so that has really helped me a great deal. I believe also uh, my experience as a fellow of the Fetzer Institute uh, in the early 2000s uh, and being uh, in meetings where we were in community with people that were struggling with issues of wholeness, authenticity and spirituality also changed my life. Uh, we had a, a, um, a, 
a, a facilitator that guided our discussions of some of the most challenging questions of our lives. Her name was Angelus Arians, and she's author of The Fourfold Way. She's then passed away. But the memory of, of, of that experience and, and uh, just being with people, and we weren't, they weren't all educators. Uh, they were from different um, the fields. For example, there was a, a producer from NPR. There was a physician from the Harvard Medical School. There was a pastor. And a couple of us were in education, but, but most were not. And to know that everyone was struggling with some of the same things. How do we, how do we change these organizations uh, that, that, that have some toxicity in them so that they're more responsive to societal issues and to our humanity? And how do we become better people as a result of that? So I think that experience was very, very helpful to me. It's helped me to grow. It's helped me gain wisdom. Uh, it's helped me to be in a space where I'm much more comfortable with myself than I was in the nineties when I used to tell people that I wanted to be a better person. Mm, nice, thanks for sharing that. Mm -hmm. And so um, what, what are your hopes and dreams for the next generation of education leaders? First of all, I'm happy you're here. I love you. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I love you, I love you too. <laughs> Secondly, uh, take what we did to the next level, take it to mm. a higher level, okay? What we did was um, one of the starting points for all of mm. you. Um, take validation to the next level, take Santi Pensante to the next, take everything, everything that's been done and just keep pushing the knowledge, keep pushing so that you, you yourselves grow and you yourselves are doing work that makes the academy a receptive space for all and so that all can grow, uh, remain authentic um, and, and know that um, as we critique, as we raise our voices, which I think certainly we should, um, but also remember that I believe that our ancestors wanted us to be healers as well. Mm. Uh, to be bridge builders, uh, to me to be community builders. So it's it's not all about being angry, although I respect that. I think that certainly we have to be angry at many things that are happening. But I think we also need to heal and to grow and to build bridges. Um, and so you know, finding that sort of balance, I think, is going to be important uh, as well. Uh, I think also, I mean, I, many of you are working on addressing systemic inequities uh, that confront our society that seep into higher education. And I think that all of that is very, very important work that will continue for many years to come. Nice, nice, yes, thank you for that. And, um, and know that you've been such a great force in my life and, and so many others. And when I think about you, you provide so much healing. I th I th as an example, I know every time we are face to face, I always end up crying <laughs> when I talk to you because it's always such a good release. I, I feel like I can release and, and, and let my heart heal. And so you have that power and you have that, um, that presence um, when um, we're together. So oh, thank, thank you. you for that. It, it, it brings to mind that it's important to work with our minds and with our hearts. How often mm -hmm. we forget to work with our heart, with our humanity. And uh, I think when we do that, people, people respond very, very well to that because so much of our emotions and our feelings and, and our humanity uh, are suppressed uh, and everything is about work, work, work. And mm. I'm not against work. I'm certainly, I think one of the hardest working people uh, in terms of, you know, everything I've done and what I'm doing, but but I also believe that um, that 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 we need to um, work with our hearts and to know that um, what we do is uh, is not just to publish, uh, although that's important, but it's about making the world a better place for everyone. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. Thank you. I'm so grateful for you and for your time. I love you. Thank you for just 
the generosity today and sharing all, all your wisdom with our listeners on Student Affairs Now. Uh, listeners, you can receive reminders about this and other episodes by subscribing to Student Affairs Now, the newsletter, or browse through our archives at studentaffairsnow.com. Thank you again to our sponsors today, Stylist Publishing and Leadership. Please subscribe to the podcast, invite others to, to, to subscribe, share on social media, or leave a five-star review. It really helps the conversation like this reach more folks and build the community so we can continue to make this free to you. Again, my name is Susana Munoz. Thanks for a fabulous, fabulous conversation with Dr. Laura Rendon today. And to everyone who's watching, watching and listening, make it a great week. Thank you.